Hi, I'm Hull History Nerd and welcome to the third episode of the History of Hull Docks. And in this episode we're going to be taking a look at the very first dock that was built outside of the town centre and the first dock built east of the River Hull, Victoria Dock, also known locally as the Timber Dock. As we saw in the last episode, the timber trade was causing some serious problems for the docks of Hull. The captains were simply dumping logs into the water and letting them float around, hitting the other ships and blocking up Quayside. And I maybe made it sound quite glib when I said that the Hull Dock Company decided to make two docks. As with everything in history, and it's rarely that simple and really frankly, that was the story that had to wait till this episode to be told. We should look into, before we go into this any further, the relationship, the very fractious relationship between the Hull Dock Company and literally everybody else in Hull. You see, at its heart, the Hull Dock Company was formed for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to build and maintain the one dock, the first dock, and its shareholders kind of wanted that situation just to continue because well, it's all a very short term way of looking at things, but basically they were only interested in the value of their shares. And it's worth pointing out that the values of those shares were skyrocketing because of the profits that they were getting from the levies on this unprecedented explosion in trade. And most of those shareholders weren't local to Hull. They were big industrialists from London, the Midlands and the West Riding. They didn't really have much play in the local politics of Hull or much interest in what was actually going on in terms of it being crowded and overwhelmed. They just wanted their share prices to keep going up. And in the short term view, if you have a business where all you do is sit back and make profit, this makes your shareholders go. On the other hand, if you decide to invest in building a dock, that's going to cost the modern equivalent of millions of pounds and your share value in the short term is going to drop and this makes your shareholders do this. And of course the whole dock company because of this developed a very conservative attitude towards spending its money and making big investments. But eventually even they were forced to admit after 20 years of petitioning that they needed a second dock and it was because of their foot dragging over that, that local interests such as Trinity House, local ship owners and businesses and the whole corporation itself managed to get the uh, Parliament Act of 1802 to build in a stipulation that would force them to build a third dock if the growth continued. But after Prince's Dock was built, that was where their obligations ended. They had no more obligation to build any further docks, why would they? It's not legally stipulated. And it did take a very long time after Prince's Dock was completed for them to actually pull their finger out and it took for that to happen some competition to rear its head. But it wasn't just the growth of trade through the port that drove the need for another dock after Junction Dock was completed. There was another pressure, one that would be far more decisive in pushing the growth of the docks to come in the future, ship size. Two different cutting-edge ship technologies that had been slowly maturing over the previous half century finally came together during the years leading up to the 1840s. High pressure steam engines and ironclad hull construction. The earliest steam engines had been low pressure affairs, capable of only giving very low power output for their size, and on ships they were often only suitable for slow river work on paddle steamers. The earliest locomotives on the first railways often travelled only marginally faster than a horse. But that all changed with the development of the high-pressure steam boiler. 
these new machines were far more compact for their power, allowing a modestly sized engine using the new screw propeller drive system to propel a much larger and much heavier ship. Wooden construction had its limits in terms of size, and sail could only propel a heavy iron ship of a fairly small size. But if you couple a high pressure steam engine with the much larger size limits of iron shipbuilding, you have the recipe for the explosive growth in the size of seagoing ships that really started to put some pressure on Hull's little old town docks. So the pressure was really on the Hull Dock Company. The advent of these larger ships that were becoming more and more common a sight in the ports of the world were proving to be too much for Hull's little town docks. Pressure was being mounted by merchants, shipbuilders, Trinity House and the corporation to build a newer deep water dock with access for these larger ships, preferably with larger locks as well to accommodate the ever increasing size of these behemoths. Likewise there was also pressure because of the problems that the timber trade were causing in the existing docks. But all the way through these protestations in the 1820s and the 1830s the whole dock company sat on its hands and just kind of went, yeah, but we're making money, so we don't care. Not really interested. Sorry, shareholders are happy. We're happy. We don't need new docks. It's fine. We can get by. Eventually, they relented and said, oh, well, maybe we'll build a little dock. One of the three big planned docks that people kept suggesting was a small adjunct to Humber Dock, which later became Railway Dock. And that was easy enough to construct. They already had Humber Dock there, so they didn't need to build a lock gate, which is often one of the more difficult aspects of building a lock. All they needed to do was just dig it out and repeat what they'd done with Humber Dock and Princess Dock. They were getting quite good at that kind of small dock. But the big dock, well, there were two suggestions. One was to build one out to the west along the banks of the Humber. That would later be developed in later years as Albert Dock. And this one. But what actually happened was a separate company was formed, the Queen's Dock Company. They were planning on building a dock that they dubbed Queen's Dock in an area of about 30 acres just here, just past the citadel. And it would be enormous and it would have a lock big enough for steamships, big steamships. And it would have timber pools so that instead of just dumping the timber into the water, they could just offload it into these shallow, huge timber ponds to keep the timber moist and let it be looked after at the leisure of the dock hands without getting in the way of anything else. And Hull Dock Company looked upon this new company with a little bit of concern because it started to dawn on them that if another company built a deep water dock to handle the increasingly large steamships that its docks couldn't handle anymore, and if that dock was also going to be kitted out for the timber trade, which represented a good chunk of the trade that was coming through the town docks, then the whole dock company might lose business. A little bit of long-term planning had to enter the short-term, very conservative mindset of the whole dock company. And they decided to nip this in the bud by also deciding to build a dock here to a pretty similar design to the Queen's Dock Company. The Queen's Dock Company was more or less just a pressure group and by the time that the Hull Dock Company decided to make this dock they withdrew their petition to Parliament and uh, sat back and let Hull Dock Company do the dirty work. And they did. And this is it. Or at least this is what's left of Victoria Dock. The construction of Victoria Dock was quite the epic. Designed by the dock company's resident engineer J.B. Hartley, not only was it reclaiming land from the Humber, which had been one of the most expensive parts of the last most expensive dock to be built, Humber Dock, but it had added layers of complexity. There wasn't just one entrance to the dock, there were two. One from the old harbour, the River Hull, at Drypool, and the other wider, deeper lock onto the Humber. And each of these entrances wasn't simple. They both had a half-tide basin between the first lock and the inner lock 
which was very useful in allowing large numbers of ships that had already finished their business in the main dock to get out of the dock itself to wait for half tide, clearing the dock for other ships that were waiting their turn in the half tide basin to go in. At half tide, the single gates would open out into the Humber, allowing ships to sail in and out without the delay of pumping the water in and out of a locked gate system. This was much more efficient in allowing ships to have a quick turnaround, but it was a lot more complex than a usual dock. To add to this, the main gate from the half tide basin into the Humber hadn't just got one channel, but two, in order to allow arrivals and departures to come in and out as quickly as possible. It was a beast of a dock, and when it finally opened after five years in the building, was the largest, most modern dock in Britain but it was expensive. Humber Dock had upset the dock company by costing the modern equivalent of £22 million. Victoria Dock rocked in at a whopping forty and a half million in today's money. It seems that the whiff of competition finally scared the usually very conservative company into action, and this wouldn't be the last time that that happened. But things weren't all roses. The chairman of the company, Joseph Robinson Peace, stepped down during the dock's construction, declaring it a folly to build a dock on the east side of the River Hull. Luckily, he was wrong. Despite the Crimean War stifling trade for a few years after the opening of the dock, it prospered and soon recovered the money that it had cost to construct, and eventually led to other future docks further east. When the dock was first built, there were concerns that it wasn't connected to the railway infrastructure. In 1840, the Holland Selby Railway had opened. Its first station was right next to Humber Dock. Railway Dock was being built alongside it. And it really gave a massive injection to pump up the trade moved from those docks. It was astonishing the difference that the railway made. And Victoria Dock being on the east bank of the River Hull were separated from that. You couldn't simply build out the railway lines from there because the entire town of Hull was basically in the way, as well as the river and the docks. And it was the York and North Midland Railway under the ownership of George Hudson, who you can hear a lot more about in my other series, The History of Hull Railways, who came to the rescue. They built out from the station, the Manor House Street station at the Humber Dock, a line that headed out westwards but then curled north and then eventually went all the way around the outside of the city to curl back round to end at Victoria Dock. This Victoria Dock branch line proved to be exactly what Victoria Dock needed to shift its timber and also to ship the coal here for export and it managed to feed it for the next hundred years of its working life. So bearing in mind that this was known as the Timber Dock and it was built primarily for the importing of timber, it might surprise you to know that it didn't just import or export timber. In fact, that was only a major part of its role, sure, but it also imported oil and linseed oil from the Baltic and wheat and barley and metals. But one of its most important exports was coal from the coal fields of South Yorkshire. In fact, one of the famous local landmarks was the huge coal hoist that was built to bodily build, pick up um, wagons from the railway and tip them into waiting coal ships for export. But the rest of the world didn't let Victoria Dock rest on its laurels for long. Ships were still getting bigger and the town docks were becoming increasingly unfit to deal with them, either being filled too quickly by the massive behemoths, 
or not even being able to fit them through their locked gates. Victoria Dock was increasingly having to handle the heavy load, and there was a renewed call even as early as the late 1850s for another deep water dock to alleviate the pressure. The Western Dock idea was being floated again. This time another company, the Western Dock Company, was threatening to build its own dock. Pressure was once again mounting on the Dock Company to do something, or risk losing out on trade. But it's not to say that the whole dock company were completely deaf to the needs for more dock capacity in the years leading up to the creation of Albert Dock. In the 1860s, for instance, Victoria Dock was extended another eight acres that way, eastwards, where those houses now stand, pretty much mark the end of the extension to the dock itself. And beyond that, where those houses are, would have been the other timber pond that was created, timber pond number two, and these timber ponds were brilliant, they were huge. One was 18 acres, the other was 14 acres, and they were large, shallow pools in which the logs could be tipped into, rather than just tipped into the water of the dock itself. And they would be kept moist, ready for being sown. But they weren't to have it all their own way forever. In the early part of the 20th century, timber started to become shipped pre-sown, in planks and rather than logs the need to keep the timber wet actually had gone so from the 1920s onwards the timber ponds started to become partially and later completely filled in and replaced with timber yards and railway sidings. The wood could be taken into the dry areas of the timber yards then loaded straight onto wagons on the sidings and shipped via the railway to anywhere else in England. And that's pretty much the pattern of usage right up until the end of the dock's services in the 1860s. When Victoria Dock was first built, it was built around the old citadel, the big triangular fortress that was built in the 17th century. And it was still felt, even in the early part of the 19th century, that Hull required a cannon fort to defend itself. But by the middle of that century, that desire had fallen away. There was a big Napoleonic fortress at Fort Paul, for instance, further along the Humber. It was felt that this was no longer necessary and it had been left to ruin for some years. So the land was sold to the Dock Company and they demolished it in the 1860s to make way for timber storage and a network of streets. That in its turn was later demolished and turned into railway sidings. But land was reclaimed, interestingly enough, out into the Humber and formed a point where the River Hull and the Humber met that became known as Sammy's Point on account of Samuelson's shipyards that used to be operating on that land. Now one of the only parts of the citadel that still remains above ground is this, this watchtower. But this is not where it originally lived and it, it's entirely contentious about whether or not it's in the right spot. But for years that was actually preserved in East Park in an area that was called by locals the rocks or the rockery. And frankly, it usually smelled of wee whenever I played in it as a kid. But thankfully, it no longer smells of wee and it's back where it's supposed to be, which is pretty awesome. But despite the extension and the timber ponds, business started to fall off by the 1870s for Victoria Dock. Albert Dock was newer and had better loading facilities the coal had a direct route there via the northeastern railway line that ran alongside it, rather than travelling around the increasingly congested Victoria Dock branch. And ship sizes were getting so big now that even Victoria Dock, which had been built to cope with larger ships, was finding itself too small. In fact, the situation in the city in general was becoming worrying leading the head of the famous Wilson Line, one of the largest shipping lines in Britain, to declare that in 1880, Hull's docks were virtually obsolete. Trade was starting to head to Goole, Grimsby and the North East, aided and abetted by the North Eastern Railway's rather dubious practice of sending coal from South Yorkshire to the much better coaling facilities at the docks of Hartlepool and Middlesbrough, docks that the North Eastern Railway owned, for the same rate as sending it to Hull, which was much closer. These pressures and the unwillingness of the dock company to build any more docks after the expenses of Victoria Dock and Albert Dock forced the hand of local businesses who, along with the corporation, 
formed a new dock company and did what so many others had threatened to do in the past. They built a new dock, Alexandra Dock, an independent railway line that bypassed the Northeastern Railway's monopoly on the railway in and out of Hull. This new dock was set up from the start for massive vessels. It had state-of-the-art coal loading facilities and was designed with its railway connection that went deep into the South Yorkshire coal fields to send timber pit props in one direction and coal in the other, thus taking away Victoria Dock's largest businesses. It remained the timber dock, but the scale of it had dwindled compared to its heyday only 30 years previously. It soldiered on through the 20th century, but the mighty new King George dock that opened in the early 20th century was the final nail in the coffin of this once state-of-the-art dock. Business dried up to almost nothing, and by the 1970s, it was closed. In the late 70s and 80s, it was filled in. The old locks stuffed with spoil to block it up, visible here from the old railway swing bridge that once crossed the main lock into the dock itself. But in the late 80s, it was revived in a surprising way. A waterfront luxury housing development used the land to build the Victoria Dock Village, using the infill dock itself as a park and keeping the half-tide basin and the lock as a beautiful testament to what used to be. Here and there, there are information boards telling visitors about the rich history of the place. And apart from the obvious dock infrastructure like the lock and the basin, there are other, more subtle clues. The local shops, for instance, have a car park that's built partly on the old quayside and partly on the infill dock. And the infill has settled and subsided significantly, causing a sudden and dramatic dip in the level of the car park. Victoria Dock may be long gone, but what's left pokes through the surface, refusing to be buried and forgotten. If you've enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you really enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help me make more of them, please feel free to visit the links in the description below to my GoFundMe and Patreon pages. And I'll see you next time for episode 4 of the History of Hold Docks, where we look at the history of the Western Dock. Albert Dock.